Hello, friends, and everybody. Welcome back to Tartlecast. Um, super excited to have our special guest on today, Suzanne Simard. And I hope I got the last name right. She is the queen of the forest. She is the OG boreal wizard. I got to tell you, she came out with this book, Finding the Mother Tree, um, after a wonderful bit of life experience between her career and personal perspectives that led into this idea of symbiotic relationships between plants and other fungi and organisms within these forests, specifically in British Columbia. The data coming from the woods is something quite remarkable. You just have to figure out where to look and how to pay attention to it. And Right now, I got to tell you, if you haven't picked up Finding the Mother Tree, it would behoove you to do so because there's much to be learned, not only about the nature of the forest, but the nature of us as human beings. So, Suzanne, thank you so much for coming on to Tartlecast. Yes, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Yeah, listen, I mean, delight's better than just like absolutely dreading talking to Jason and I, (laughs) you know? No way. (laughs) you You got a lot of personal stories in here. Um, Suzanne, and they're quite wonderful. And I'm glad you bridged the aspects of what was going on through your own personal journey and also the scientific sort of business aspects that were going on. And then also how you mirrored aspects of the forest in the way it's, you know, purpose was driven and how you actually brought that purpose into your own life and how that actually challenged many of the things you were doing in terms of your work for Weyerhaeuser and other companies. Um, to change the game in forestry. And what I found most remarkable about this and the fact that it seems to be missed is that most times in life, it's the things that are unseen that typically are the key drivers to the things that are seen. And I think about that in the sense of human thoughts. Nobody can see them, but they're driving everything else. They cause us to do these actions. and when you stood out in the forest, and I would love for you to speak about this, you see the trees and you see that some are flourishing, some are failing, clear cutting does not, does not work, you know, free to grow, all this other stuff. It lacked the natural balance and biodiversity required for life. And so what you needed to do was you're like, I got to go deeper. And in a very physical sense, you looked under the soil. And in that unseen world is where you found the answers to what was actually foundationally allowing life to flourish within the forests of British Columbia. So would you mind just for the people that haven't read this, tell them a little bit about what that means. Well, you know, when, when you're walking in the forest and you see this incredible place, right? We all, I I don't know, most of us feel really amazing and good in the forest. I mean, I think some people are afraid, but um, the more time you spend in the forest, the more you love it. And, um, and actually what's going on below your feet is even more interesting. It's just, we can't see it. And so we've, we've not understood it and maybe, and we've ignored it as well. And, but now, nowadays, you know, our scientific tools are developing at this rapid pace and it's allowing us to put a microscope down in the soil. And, and that's basically what I did when I was looking at, you know, as you said, these plantations that that were growing up in clear cuts, clear cutting after uh, taking away old growth forests and replacing them with these, you know, these rows of pines. Um, And, and what we found in looking below ground is that, is that that beautiful old growth forest, which is a highly connected place where, where trees are in constant uh, conversation. I'll call it that in science, we call them interactions. Mm. They're, they're constantly in this back and forth uh, conversation um they that is very sophisticated and they do this through a number of ways they 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 um communicate through the air they also communicate through through these fungal networks that run through the soil and actually link trees together and when these old forests are cut down that conversation is is basically stopped um the fungal network that is like the the internet below ground it's it's you can think of it as a bunch of telephone wires even but the internet through which information passes between trees that when when it's replaced with plantations that internet suddenly it goes silent for a little while 
Um, and it kind of starts to rebuild a little bit with a few linkages, but not nearly the complex, the complexity. It would be like, you know, you know, you're broadcasting to, to over 200 countries. Right. It would be like, um, suddenly you're only broadcasting to one and that's your own country. Oh, once it's replaced with this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, so it completely simplifies the system. The diversity of those connections goes way down. Um, and it takes decades, if not centuries, for these old forests to recover that sophisticated way of, of uh, trees interacting together as a society. And really, they are a society because um, because they are all linked together and they are all communicating and, uh, and being very, you know, attuned to each other, just as we are in our towns, our families, our countries. So there's, there's much diversity that happens there. And the forest is essentially speaking about this data very organically and you're witnessing it as an observer. The forest, even though each of these organisms are have very distinct characteristics making them what they are, they understand that there's great benefit in the symbiotic relationship of them coming together for their own support, their own longevity, and their own evolution within these very, very old forests that have predated us as human beings, frankly. And when we look at that, I think there's much to be learned for society as a whole. And don't you think that we could actually find a bridge, maybe at least one pertinent example about understanding ourselves and other selves and the great benefit and longevity we can find from something like that? Yes, and I think that's why I called it finding the mother tree is because it really is a search, you know, in in ourselves and in, in our in our natural world, which is, you know, us and all our relations, which include the trees and the fungi and the animals like it's finding ourselves in that world. Like what it, what is our role? What is our place? And have we lost our way, which I, I would say we have in many ways. And this is manifested in you know, huge global indicators, right? Those global indicators are we have climate change. Mm. We have a mass extinction on our hand, the sixth one yep. um, that's caused by human beings. We have like people are migrating to get away from suffering. And um, we have the coronavirus. All these are indicators that that we've gotten, we've, we've gotten on the wrong path. And that wrong path is, um, I call it a wrong path because we, a lot of us, or at least the people that are making the big policy decisions, the practices, and ultimately they're doing it for us, the people. Um, we, we've forgotten that we're just part of this big network of, of organisms that make up our biosphere. You know, we've sort of got on onto this thing that we're superior, that, you know, that nature is for us to manipulate um, for our own benefits. And that is, for example, cutting down our trees, clear cutting our forests. And by the way, where I live in British Columbia, we only have 3% of our old growth forests left wow. of our iconic old growth forests. It means we've clear cut 97% of them, right? So this is, this is a travesty. And so it's not a trivial thing at all. And so what I'm hoping in the book is that, you know, as people read the book and read the stories and that they absorb the science, even as they're reading the stories and enjoying the stories that, um, that they go, you know what, like, there's a message here that um, that this connection of uh, up among ourselves, among trees, ourselves with trees, it, like we are all linked together. We have these relationships that should be built on respect, reciprocity, um, you know, carrying out our responsibilities uh, and the, that we, you know, we need to come back to this and create these you know, healthy linkages back to our environment. And that also transfers over to how we behave in our own human societies too. It's basically, you know, these relationships are ubiquitous, no, no matter whether you're a, a human being or a squirrel or a tree or, you know, they, it, I'm a relationships are squirrel. what we are. What's that? I'm a pretty tall squirrel then. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Listen, you made the, Suzanne, you made this point about nature and we were cutting it down and we're almost isolating ourselves from it. But it's this ridiculous human paradox that we've created because we are in fact nature. So as we go and we clear cut these things where it's almost like you're clear cutting your own feet off. You know, if it, I understand that trees help scrub the air. It's a function of the things that, you know, afford us oxygen, much like phytoplankton in the water. 
So every time you cut one down, remember that takes oxygen away from something that needs it. That may be a human or another animal or you know something else for that point. And understanding the simplicity of that, but when brought together, it looks complex. But the idea is fundamental in the fact that these forests help us survive and we are one in the same with that nature. And I think that's a lesson that we all need to continue to learn when it comes to, you know, taking a walk in the woods and understanding one another, regardless of where we are. Because a tree scrubbing oxygen, you know, in Canada, who knows where that oxygen molecule goes? It may go over to somebody in Australia. But what it's like, is oxygen just isolated? No, the whole thing is completely interconnected, right? Mm-hmm. And there's there's so much genius to the, you know, the design of how these things have evolved over time. And like you say, we have to look to that wisdom. And when I think of the word wisdom, first you have knowledge, right? And then you got experience. If you keep them separate, Nothing really is going on there. But when you bring them together, now you're wise. Because now I'm acting upon truthful information that's very ob- ob- you know, objective and in front of me. And then these wise decisions are beneficial not only for the forests, but for us as human beings. And as we begin to respect nature, we begin to respect ourselves. But because we have this sort of mental disconnect, I think it's what's driven us so far away and into this sort of corner of climate instability, right? And through these wars and all the other things that are currently happening with humans that, you know, we are the progenitor of. Am I off base with that? No, you are absolutely right on. You know, you're absolutely right. Like the forest. So the forest, I'm just giving you a few stats to bolster what you're saying. The forests cover like one third of our terrestrial ecosystems, right? One third of our land base is covered in forests. And, and yet forests, um, you know, you're right, they generate oxygen for us to breathe. Without, that, without the forest doing that through photosynthesis, they basically take CO2 out of the atmosphere, take water from the soil, combine them through this amazing process called photosynthesis, and it generates oxygen right. and carbohydrates that are then base, basically run, you know, make a tree grow <clears throat> and drive all of our biogeochemical cycles. So that means the oxygen cycle, the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, the water cycles all depend on these forests. So, you know, worldwide or, you know, in Canada, 80% of our clean water comes from forests, right? 85% of the global carbon storage in terrestrial ecosystems is in forests. 80% of our creatures in the world live in forests. Mm -hmm. So even though they're only like one third of our land base, they are responsible. They're basically our life support systems. And you're right. Like, what are we doing? Like, we're clear cutting these forests as fast as we possibly can, especially the old growth forests, because we think, you know, we've, we've basically simplified our connection to nature through the dollar, right? Through oh, our economic system. Here we saying. go. Tell me how you really feel. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, like, is it, are our lives worth that two bucks we got for that two by four? Here we go. I don't think so. Nope. I think my kids' lives are, are, you know, priceless and all the children's lives in the world and all the coming generations. It's not worth, a you know, it's not worth cutting down all our forests for profits right now. And I don't mean profits that go to people. These profits are stuffed in the pockets of corporate CEOs for the most part. Right. You know, they're like headless horsemen and, and they don't, they don't bear a responsibility. They don't, they have no obligation to the land. They feel no obligation to the people. And so we're like pawns basically. And, you know, and our lives depend on it. And, and so, yeah, don't get me started. No, I love getting <laughs> you no, no, started. No, I, yeah. I want to get into this. Susan, uh, uh, um, uh, Suzanne, I'm from Washington state and it was just a common occurrence to see clear cutting. So I kind of want to get a little micro with you. Cause you talk about this with your family. Um, what is kind of the old system and why is it so mm-hmm. brutal to the environment in the way that they're logging, especially with clear cutting? Yeah. So, you know, the old system. So I grew up in a horse logging family. Yeah. Right. And and I so I know what it's like to cut down a tree. I've cut down trees. But my great grandfather, my grandfather, my dad, my uncles, they took, you know, they only took a couple of trees out of those forests a week. Or, or, you know, maybe a couple of days sometimes. And my grandpa would go up into the forest and he would make a map 
and he would say, here's all the trees and we're going to take this one and that one and that's it. And, and so that's called selective harvesting. And, you, you know, selective harvesting has to be done carefully. You have to know your local forest to know which trees to take out, which trees to leave so that it's a regenerative practice, meaning that the trees are going to grow back, you know, without trouble. Whereas clear cutting, you basically take all the trees, like everything, because it's cheap to do that. And it's brings the huge profits. And what they're really after are those great big old trees, which I call mother trees, which mm. we can get into, but they're the most valuable trees in the forest ecologically, but they're also the, what we prize for their economic value. And so, you know, and, and when you clear cut and take out all these trees, what happens? Well, all kinds of things happen. One biodiversity goes way down, Yeah, you know, of the plants, the fungi, the trees, everything we've measured. it. Yeah. <laughs> we know we've got the numbers. Also, we lose at least half the carbon right off the bat. Wow. Okay, so that carbon, the trees, goes into products. And some of those products are toilet paper. Some of them are uh, paper. Some of them are cardboard. Some, some of them are packaging. Some, and a little tiny amount goes into a long-term storage. But 65% estimates are immediately, we assume, evaporates into thin air. Immediately on harvest. And so if you've got 1,000 tons of carbon in a hectare, as soon as you clear cut it, 500 of it has gone up in the atmosphere almost right away. And then the rest of the ecosystem slowly decomposes some of that carbon in the forest floor. And, and also what else happens? The water table comes up because the trees aren't there anymore and because they're not transpiring water out their crowns. And so we raise the water table, warm the soil, decomposition speeds up. If it's on a steep slope, that whole soil can right slough down the slope and then you're basic back at primary succession. It's not the same thing as a wildfire or a partial cut. It's way more severe and it's it's the most draconian thing that we could do, but we do it for money. You know, let's talk about that money. So I, this is actually kind of serendipitous. Some years ago, I wrote a paper on um, essentially base fundamental resources for economies. And even if you look at just money in general as energy, there's one thing I looked at and that was called the Faustman formula. You know what that is? Yeah, I do. Yeah. So it's been a long time since I thought about yeah, it, but yeah. German Forrester Martin Faustman, 1849. And what they were trying to figure out is if I have a specific amount of land and there's a specific amount of trees in it, what is the optimal time for me to cut down whatever amount of trees within that land? And then on top of that, you could also invert that ratio to say, well, how many trees can be supported by the soil itself? Because, you know, from an economic thought, you're like, okay, I have all this space. These trees are pretty spaced out. Let's just put these things in rows and put as many as we can as possible. And then from that, that means we'll have a higher yield. But you're actually crushing the nutrient level. It goes down because it can't support essentially the amount of credit that's been instilled into that system, which would I would, I would say more lumber, right? So here's what I'm curious about. And, and you wrote this on, this was earlier in the book, page 43. You made a comment. You said, I blurted, you know, the way they sometimes leave the big seed trees in Germany. Martin Faustman understood something in 1849. The Germans were figuring something out. What is it? Because you actually didn't go into it. And I feel like it was just glazed over, but it's really <laughs> fundamentally important because... Germany is not as big as the U.S. or British Columbia, but they still have plenty of trees. What mm -hmm. did they figure out that we were over here on the you know Western part of the world just completely ignoring? Yeah, that's a great question, and it's a deep. There's you know there's a lot of depth to the answer in that. So yeah, European forestry was well established over you know thousands of years, and and families like German families would have, you know, they would actually own or have, or the royalty would have jurisdiction over whole valleys, but they, you know, Germany is a, I actually haven't been to Germany myself, but I understand it as a diverse place with lots of valleys and each valley is unique. The forest is unique and people that, that were had ownership or, or management practices over that valley, usually they're family owned valleys, um, they would figure out what worked in that valley, right? They try things and they say, well, you know, th their soils are like this and the trees are like this aspect. We're going to try, you know, maybe this partial cutting or selection or seed trees. 
and it worked, right? They And they go back and say, well, that worked. And I mean, we can adjust things a little here. And, and so they develop their practices over experience and knowledge, like you said, and ultimately their wisdom. And um, whereas, and so those German, you know, those German practices were well honed and that those civil the, what we call civil culture systems in forestry the seed tree method partial partial retention methods um shelter wood methods mm. selection methods those were developed from that very fine tuning and when europeans colonized north america they um they didn't understand the land right the the land was understood by the Aboriginal people who had lived here for 10,000 or more thousand years, who were practicing, you know, land management or land stewardship, like kind of like the Germans were doing here already for thousands of years. They understood, you know, you know, when the, the salmon berries bloomed and when the salmon ran, ran and when the cedar bark was fresh for, for harvesting the bark, what tree cultivating, which trees were going to become the totems or the canoes. It was, there was a lot of care taken up. But when Europeans came to North America and colonized, um, we just got started moving basically across North America from the East Coast to the West Coast, cutting the forests, you know, to to develop our society, um, ignoring, basically ignoring the Aboriginal w- wisdom or ridiculing it. Um, and, and, so, and ultimately then, you know, slowly it was like a settlement, but then in the, you know, the, by the 1900s, you know, the mid 1900s, it was it was not very regulated, but then suddenly, you know, not suddenly, but slowly, <laughs> over a, over a few decades, um, there was a realization that these forests were extremely valuable, and the, and and the the commercial interests got sold off to big multi, you know big companies in Canada. Um, we basically uh, let out licenses to to harvest our forests, and it became like this economic commodity. You know, so the forest became a commodity. Um, and, and it was it was more from settlement to and getting rid of our fear of forests to oh it's a commodity, and then in order to exploit that commodity, we did ap- adopt German forestry practices carte blanche basically. But then you know even some of those German forestry practices, the partial cutting, the variety that was available to us, slowly converged into well the most economically expedient way. And the biggest profit is going to come from clear cutting. And so it doesn't matter if you're in Northern California or if you're in Alaska or if you're in British Columbia. If you look on Google Maps, it doesn't matter what kind of forest you're in. It's clear cutting. It's not based on the nuances of that valley, the peculiarities of that soil, the aspect that's over here, when the salmon berry blooms. It's not based on that kind of knowledge or, or wisdom, as you would say. It's it's really, it's just a based on the dollar. How much can we make? And Faustman's formula, by the way, I mean, it, it was based on wood production. Now we know um, that actually, now that we've exploited the forest so thoroughly, and our life support systems are on the verge of collapse, basically. Um, now we say, oh, you know what? Maybe the forest isn't just valuable for its two by fours, that there's other values. And we have not incorporated that into Faustman's formula at all. And if we were to and say, actually, we want to keep our forests in the ground to store carbon, which is suddenly becoming priceless, suddenly that formula you know, needs to be totally rejigged. And the timing of cutting those forests it might never make sense or it's going to be a lot longer in the future than the, the 80 years or 100 years that that formula would tell you. We need the the Simard model, I think. Somebody's got to write a Wikipedia page immediately and I think you can <laughs> rework that, no problem. All that statistical experience you got when you're working with Ted and everybody else, you know? Um, that's. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's finally interesting. You know, you used a keyword here. And I would like you to define it for us. Stewardship. What does stewardship mean to you? It meant something to yeah, the original Germans cutting down their trees and having their land. But when something becomes commercial and it leaves personal responsibility and turns into sort of a corporate responsibility, stewardship changes. It becomes a little bit more flexible. How would you define stewardship? Yeah, that's such a great question. You know, maybe we can, uh, um, so there's, if we can look at a continuum of what, what we do, right? So at the worst, it's we exploit. Mm-hmm. That's not stewardship. That's just mining the forest. It's basically taking what nature gave us and making profits from it. Okay. Um, 
then we could move from, and, we, and this is basically how forestry developed across North America. We went in a period of exploitation. And then as we started to realize that, you know, actually these resources aren't infinite, <laughs> there's a limit here, then we kind of went into this regulation period. We're going to start regulating the forest and maybe even planting it. That I call kind of a, the early signs of management, right, where we're actually in there actively into interacting with the forest and trying to regulate what we do. And then, but that wasn't good enough because, you know, in Canada, that 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 management period or regulation period actually resulted in a dramatic increase in our cut, right? So mm. it wasn't really management. It was still management to make money. And and then we started getting, you know, people started going, hey, I don't really like that those forests around me are all getting cut down. And and so then we sort of went into, into this period in the, in, in the U.S. anyway, in the 1980s and 90s, into a period of like, well, maybe we should include some science here. Let, let's, let's think about how these forests are um, responding to what we're doing. And let's, oh, and actually we understand that old trees are important. We understand coarse woody debris is important. Soils are essential. And so we went into this sort of period of science-based management. We're still not at stewardship yet, right? Yeah. Stewardship is actually taking uh, our responsibilities seriously. And I mean, I don't mean responsibilities to the corporate heads or to the bank or even to creating... Um, you know, gross domestic product. I'm talking about our responsibility and obligations to the land, right? Take it seriously. That's where you actually know and care about these other creatures. And you're actually in there, like you're looking after your own families, right? Because you are essentially, you're looking after your family, the, 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 your grandchildren, your great grandchildren, the seven generations coming forward as the indigenous people look at their worldview as based on what is seven going to look like in seven generations. And if it's not going to look good, which, you know, I look across that seven generations, that, that'll be like in 2100, we're expecting our global temperatures to go up by five degrees. It's like unlivable. Can't have that. So stewardship, stewardship is actually taking our obligations to being creatures on this earth, to look after our biosphere and each other and our land and our resources, taking it seriously and paying attention to the variability in the environment, taking care. If it's not time to harvest that forest, we're not going to do it, right? Instead of just plowing in there and taking it all, no matter what. Right. We've done, you know, we've done it with the salmon, we've done it with the cod, we've done it with the forest. And it's time to step back and actually be true stewards of these resources to really care for them. So that's that's stewardship to me. Could you tattoo everything you just said, like on my neck and like my chest? <laughs> I don't have the most beautiful body, but I'll walk around shirtless to talk like that all day long. That was fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Um, but because of that, you've put together this tomb of truth, as I would call it. Have they listened? And you know who I'm talking about with they. I don't need to name names. Have they listened? Yeah. Um, not really, like not in a meaningful way. Okay. Um, and when I say meaningful, uh, you know, what I call for in the book is to, is to just what we talked about being good stewards of the land. Right. And that is like, you know, if we're, we're going to continue to, to harvest trees and use trees, we always have no, since the beginning of humans, because we've lived in forests and we use forests. Um, we're, you know, we need this place to survive. We need food, shelter, and all the basic needs of humans. So we're going to continue to do that. But but, um, you know, in order to do it properly, as we say, we need to be wise about it. And and so far, governments have not been wise and they haven't even taken the knowledge to get to wise yet. Right. Like I, I love the way you defined wisdom. Um, and and so, you know, there's still in this economic model, let's make as much money as we possibly can. We're going to call it in the name of jobs. Even while, you know, our, in the last five years where I live in British Columbia due to mechanization, even as we're exploiting the forest faster and faster, taking more and more, our job, the jobs have been cut by 40%, mm. right? So, yeah, so so we need to move away from that exploitive thing. And I can't, you know, um, I can't remember what the other part of your question was, but uh, no, maybe just, you could repeat me. Yeah, me. I, all I'd really asked was, have they listened? Are they actually and, yeah, so, taking right. the appropriate? So no, action? they haven't. They haven't. So here we are. I'm in, you know, at home. I grew up in a, a province of old growth forest, yeah. right? I was born in 1960. I was surrounded by iconic old growth forests, beautiful forests. I live now in a sea of clear cuts. And 
those iconic old growth forests, those big tall cedars, the red, you know, we don't have redwoods, but imagine the redwoods, the big Sitka spruces on the coast, uh, the big dug firs in the inland rainforests, you know, they're almost gone. We've only got 3% of them left. And even on, on Vancouver Island right now, you might have heard that there's huge protests going on. There's blockades to protect the last watershed on Vancouver Island yeah. from clear cutting. Like, can you imagine, like, how could we be so short sighted? So if they had paid attention to what I was talking about, about being careful and sensitive and being stewards and, you know, and leaving the old trees, we wouldn't be doing that. So yeah, no, they haven't. The big indicators are no, they haven't listened. Suzanne, um, we have a lot of millennials listen to our podcast and, um, and it's a technology podcast. So we have scientists and stuff like that. Listen, what if you have a young scientist just as you were, and you got all this data and you found this truth and then you presented it and it was just extremely frustrating to go through that. If, you know, with your wisdom, if somebody's going through that right now, getting ridiculed, or they, they've come up with something like that, what, what would you give to them? You know, somebody, yes. or what would you give to your younger self in that situation? That is such a great question. And, and, you know, um, I would say, keep your power and speak your truth. Um, and don't let, don't let the bastards get you down. Love it. I love <laughs> That's it. my stepfather. <laughs> I'm sending you a t-shirt with that on it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I mean, okay. So how do you do that? Like if you feel alone, like I definitely felt alone in the wilderness myself. Mm. Um, I had friends, I did have, I did have people supporting me and, and it wasn't, it wasn't enough to make the big difference. Like I would have liked before we're only down to our last 3%. Um, But it's absolutely essential that you have this this support network. So you got your, you've got your truth, you got your idea, you're feeling silenced, you you gather your group, right? And, And that is your, like there's, there's advanced, there's, there's benefits of being in numbers. And so, you know, you get your supporters. And and so when the, when the, when, when the, the volleys of arsenal comes at you, um, that you're protected, right? Or at least, you know, if you get hit, you can go to your friends and say, I need some support here. But if you're by yourself, you can't make it, you can't, you can't, you'll never get your, I don't think you'll get your idea out there. And so, um, yeah, so persistence, you know, and don't, don't, don't let them tell you that you're not you're not good right that you're not your ideas are bad like don't let them tell you that be stick with your convictions and can and also do your continue your excellent work right continue to find out more and more and build your story until you've got this you know and and, and keep your voice out there and keep your support system out there and then you know in time in time if you're persistent you keep going then because we are complex systems, <laughs> really, we, we're built to suddenly change. So if you keep push, 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 it can change. And actually, I was listening to, um, to Rachel Maddow last night, one of my favorite commentators, and she was talking to Bill McKibben. And Bill McKibben was talking about how, you know, um, is it like the big oil companies, they've said, like the Dutch suddenly have ruled that, that, uh, that the, you know, I forget which oil company it is, but it doesn't matter. Royal Dutch like, there's Shell. so many big ones. Yeah, Shell. Mm-hmm. And, and there's Exxon, those great big standard oil. That suddenly there's been like three huge court rulings that say these countries have to reduce their emissions by 45% to 20, by 2030. And suddenly that puts a huge amount of pressure on these big oil companies. And it's a tipping point in the right direction, yeah. right? It's Bill McKibben, Naomi, Naomi Klein, Rachel Maddow, all the people working hard, all of us who are working for the environment, you guys, me, suddenly there's a shift and it's a shift in a positive direction. And if you give up, we'll never get to that shift. But the shifts do happen because that's how systems work. It's like you push, 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 the relationships start to change in a little bit and suddenly you get a big change. And those can be big t- positive tipping points they can also be terrible tipping points going the other way but what we want it to be is a tipping point in the right direction and i feel like we are kind of with joe biden in there making his you know pushing to have to decarbonize which is going to meet a bunch of resistance i'm sure but he's going to have to keep pushing getting people behind me slowly convincing the people that this is the way to go and these decisions each one of them add to it to build up to something really positive. And if you give up in your work early on because somebody, you know, you, you got offended or, or it was hard, don't give up, right? Just speak your truth and keep going. 
that, that, that's my advice. We've been offended so many times. I don't even know what it's like to be offended anymore. <laughs> I don't even know what's left of me. Yeah, you, you know? can just brush it away. Yeah. Yeah, oh, that was interesting. That was like a gnat coming by, you know, just swat it. <laughs> When, you, when you're young, it doesn't feel like a gnat. It feels like you've been hit by an elephant. You know, it's, it's funny. You know, and uh, you know, per- it's it's truly an elephant. <laughs> it's truly an elephant. Yeah, you know, perspectives per- perspectives so interesting. So, for the people that are championing your work, like yourself, who are the ones that you find are really leading the torch with these efforts? Maybe not for profits or anybody of that sort that are really really making sense and taking action upon what needs to be acted upon. Yeah. Um, who are they? Well, let's just talk about the value of those people Please. first. And yeah. I'm going to make an analogy with the forest. So what I found in my research in mapping what these mycorrhizal networks look like below ground, um, I discovered that, you know, we discovered my graduate students, my colleagues, and I it was a bunch of us working together. Everything that's good takes teamwork. Right. Um, we made a map of what the network looks like in the forest, and we found that the big old trees are the centers. They're the hubs of the network. They're, they are highly connected to everything else. They, they transmit all kinds of information and uh, resources to, throughout the forest. Um, they're like the matriarchs of the forest. And, you know, every society has got leaders like that, right? It doesn't mean that the other people aren't important. They are extremely important. All the all the trees are important. And there's a dynamic going on all the time. You know, there's a leader and then maybe it'll die back and then another one, a leader rises up. But there's always this shifting and, and then there's the followers and they might become leaders. So it's a dynamic system, whether in a social system or a forest system. But those leaders are super important. So Bill McKibben, for example, Naomi Klein, you know, they're important thought leaders. James Hansen was an important thought leader, um, you know. Mar- Lynn Margulis was an important thought leader in understanding that symbiosis or endosymbiosis was an important part of evolution. Charles Darwin was an important thought leader. So we we got to f- find those people, and you know, and they 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 lead us, right? And and um, and so who are they? Who are the ones that are driving things right now? Well, I mean, we're all playing an important role. I have to emphasize. There's you know. It's important to have small action all the way up to big action. Right. And the small actions are just as important. That's the grassroots movements. That's YouTube. That's viral. You know, that's how things go viral is like hearts and minds. That's important. But then you need this leadership part too. Who's going to drive the way? Well, you know, if you're lucky, you've got a good leader. Like I think Joe Biden is a good leader. I think, um, you know, that's my my own feeling, but you had a terrible leader before, right? Who was driving things the other way. So so when you get a good one, then then invest in them the power to do good work. Right. And in the environmental movement, I would say like the NGOs are hugely important right now. Um and uh and I think that they're going to supersede uh, at some point. The people are going to invest their power more in the NGOs, the green parties, because we see our lives are on the line, right? Or we're going to force the the their more status quo uh, gov- democratic governments into serving the people people more, and so they can take over that thought leadership position from the angos and um, at some point. But they've got to be able to do their job and serve their creds and and build good policy. But if they don't, then you know people will start moving over to other you know other thought leaders. And and we have great leaders in this world. And you know it, it's important to um, to let them lead us or to get their thoughts out so that, you know, so that we're informed, we're educated, that we have, you know, science-based approaches to things instead of emotional and, you know, ill-informed approaches. So I don't know if I, I haven't answered your question completely directly. I think the media plays a hugely important part as well. I, I see that in the launching of my book, right? My book would have been ignored again yeah. if I didn't have the media and and the publicity team behind me driving this. It was all, every step, every piece, every person is extremely important in making this message get out. So, you know, uh, um, so we need to, we need to make sure that we have these networks in place to support if there is a great thought coming out. Like I think the book, this book is one example. There's lots, Rachel Maddow's book, Blow, another great example, you know, Stacey Abrams, another other you know, there's amazing examples out there um but we need to support them and get them let them filter up to people's consciousness and so media plays a hugely important role in doing that as well 
filter up to the consciousness. It's like send the sugars out and I'm going to pull the water right back up to where I need, right? <laughs> what, just to kind of cap this off, I'm talking about tree cover here. What does utopia look like for the forest? And what does utopia look like for us as human beings in relation to that nature? Well, I think the, a key word is balance, right? I mean, we live in a biosphere that is a, a self-reinforcing biosphere. James Levlock wrote about this beautifully in, in his and Glenn Margulis, the Gaia theory. Um, and, and that Gaia theory has been in our consciousness, in our cultures for since the beginning of time. I mean, they came up with the word Gaia, which is like a, I, I don't know if that's a Greek name or, it's but you know, those, <laughs> is that? Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> In, in the, the Coast Salish, they call it Netsamatsk, yep. which means we are one. And there's a word in every language for we are all in this together. And, you know, we make our own world, our own healthy world. So in a forest, it's about balance. And that means, you know, the ability to, to photosynthesize. I can't photosynthesize. I can't emphasize enough. Photosynthesis is what drives our lives. It's the it's that highly evolved, beautiful intricate machinery that has allowed us to have oxygen on our earth and clean water and allowed human beings and, and our dogs and cats to evolve, right? So we have to protect that very basic thing. And, and the forest then is going to be in balance. And, and so high, high photosynthetic capacity, that means, you know, at carrying capacity of native plants and trees. And if you create holes in it by clear cutting it, life will fill in, but it's not, if, it, if you do it in a sloppy way, like getting rid of the forest floor, taking out all the mother trees, getting, you know, disrupting the hydrology, then a bunch of weeds are going to move in and it's out of balance. So we need to make sure when we're managing ecosystems that we leave enough behind, enough of the wisdom from the past, the genes, the seeds, the coarse woody debris, the forest floor, the soil, that it's all left there to rebuild the forest because the forest is always going to be wanting to renew itself. And also uh, with that is the natural disturbance cycles that we need to let those carry out their, their imprint on the ecosystem. You know, our forests in North America are fire by and large fire regenerated forests. Well, we've disrupted that whole cycle, right? We stop, we suppress fire fuels built up. We've got climate change, lots of heat. So we're getting these big mega fires out of balance. So we need to sort of, in order to help our forests get back into balance, we need to allow these natural disturbances to carry out their good jobs of renewing the forest. But, you know, we also have to be part of this, right? We can't just let nature take its course because there's lots of us here now and we've created this climate change that's going so fast that trees can't adapt as quickly. And so we have an important role it's our obligation to help these ecosystems, you know, recover and to and to sort of control these natural disturbances so that it's, you know, we, we don't create mega fire disasters. We, you know, it's got to be done very carefully. It's got to be science based. Yeah. It's got to be knowledge based. So Why? It's got to be wise. This will be my this will be my last question slash comment. <clears throat> you are not perfect. I am not perfect. Jason's not perfect. None of our listeners are perfect. There are points in our lives where the data stares us in the face, but we choose to ignore it. And I'm sure this has happened with you. What afforded you the self-awareness to look at the data for what it was and start to act intelligently with wisdom upon it? I know there were many times where you just ignore, 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 and it's screaming at you in the face. How did you build that self-awareness to be like, oh, this is the key. This will open up that pathway, that door for me. What was that for you? Yeah, that's a really great question. Like, I always call myself a survivalist, right? Like, I, I just needed to survive in this system. So I was very focused on just, you know, keeping my job, being able to do my work that I always loved my work, right? Driven by you know, my love for the forest and knowing how essential it was. So that was with me the entire time. Um, and and I, I, I'm fortunate that I grew up in these forests. I could see what they're supposed to look like and what we were doing with them. Um, so I had that drive. But then, you know, and, and I was watching our forest did be disconnected. You know, a forest is a place of connection and relationships. And what we're doing is disconnecting them. And throwing away the relationships or minimizing them till they're simplified and don't work anymore. 
And, and I was struggling with this. What is it that we don't get? You know, I knew what we didn't get, but why aren't people listening? And what is it that we're missing? You know, what, what can I tell people? And I started working with the Aboriginal people of British Columbia and I got a, a postdoc, Dr. Teresa Ryan, who started, and, and I started working with a number of Indigenous people and they taught me about connection that, I mean, I understood it, but then they, they, they just said, this is, this is our worldview. It is about connection. And I'm going, that's, that's it. That's, that's what, that's what the forest managers, the, the, the economists, the, you know, the, the politicians are missing that part. And, and then I'm like, okay, this is it. This is the main message. And so once I could get that in my mind, as a white person who was, came from a colonist family, who settled in Western Canada, who struggled, who grew up in the forest and knew that things were not going well and trying to get, you know, articulate this. And, I'm, and finally, she just said, oh, it's about connection. It's about balance. You know, we are all in this together. We're one. And I'm like, that's it. And so then I started saying, I've got to tell people. I've got to tell all my white folks who don't get this. Tell the white friends you can't is... figure it out. You know what I mean? <laughs> I the damn white I mean, timbers, sounds... get it straight. Well, it's so frustrating that we have ignored and ridiculed that indigenous knowledge for so long. And yet that is the key, right? <laughs> and so, okay, now we know it's the key. So let's go. We don't take the knowledge from them. We learn from it, right? And develop an even broader knowledge, bring together Western science, indigenous science through re respect and cooperation, because we're all in this together, right? We all want our children to live to the next generation and so on. Right. So we can come together and create something beautiful and wise. Thank you very much for sticking your neck out there above the tree line amongst the buzz saws, you know, going up against people that are, you know, very profit driven and for frankly, could care less, which doing is not easy. And I'm sure there have been times when it's been immensely frustrating, which you have never shared and, you know, emotionally turmoil inside. But I think that has helped refine your story, uh, the power behind that story, and looking for the things where you can really find that connection point amongst others. So you are that walking network of wisdom. Thank you for putting it in this book. Thank you for sharing it on here. Thank you for putting up with us. And thank you for asking, you know, for, you know, asking good questions and telling us fantastic answers to at the same time. Uh, Suzanne, um, is there anything else you want to leave us with other than all these phenomenal uh, mic drops you've left already? I would say I do have one last message is, um, you know, there are kids out there putting their lives on the line, whether they're in Amazon or on Ferry Creek on Vancouver Island, or probably in the taiga of Russia, we just don't see them putting their lives on the line to change the trajectory that we're on. They're basically, you know, chaining themselves to trees and saying, it's, this is our lives you're screwing around with. We need to support them. And, you know, we need to all be in there saying this stuff. So I think that's my final message. Um, I support, you know, I support this. I, we're here, we're here for you, you know, and, and we're all in this together. We're, we're, and we're all, it's all of us together making these changes happen. So yeah, that's amazing. That's my final and thank you so much. Those were awesome questions and great conversation. <laughs> well, hopefully, you know, that's what we're here for. Just trying to, uh, just trying to learn. Right. So it's, uh, yes. I don't know. No, I'm just straight shook. You, maybe you can take me a walk through the woods sometimes. Does that sound good. If I ever make it up to BC. I would love to. All right. Yeah. Well, listen, my I'll friend, come down. we will, uh, we will be in touch. Thank you again.